Um, I'm Ashley Powers. I teach in the political science department, and I am this year's president of the Millsaps chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. As such, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Lecture. Um, as our nation's oldest and most prestigious honor society, Phi Beta Kappa has been a tireless advocate for excellence in the liberal arts. And it is this purpose, to this purpose, that the organization established in 1956 our Visiting Scholar Program. The Visiting Scholar Program brings nationally recognized scholars to liberal arts campuses across the country to dialogue with students and faculty and to present public lectures. Since 1956, Phi Beta Kappa has named 466 visiting scholars, and Millsaps has been honored to host several of those on our campus. Today, the Millsaps chapter of Phi Beta Kappa welcomes visiting scholar William Swiker to our campus. Dr. Swiker is Edward L. Ryerson, Distinguished Service Professor of Theological Ethics at the University of Chicago. He is also the director of the university's Martin Marty Center for the Advance of Study, the Advanced Study of Religion. His scholarship in teaching crosses disciplinary lines of ethics, systematic theology, and hermeneutical philosophy. He is also the author of several books, including most recently, The Dust That Breathes, Christian Faith, and the New Humanism. We at Millsaps are making uh, good use of Professor Swiker during his time at Millsaps. This morning, he was in Lola Williamson's Peace Studies class talking with them, and uh, he also had lunch with a group of our students in the CAF. Tomorrow morning, he'll be in Dr. Hopkins's um, Philosophy of Religion class uh, talking with them. And right now, we are happy to welcome him for his public lecture entitled Against the Seductions of Transhumanism. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming this year's Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar, Dr. William Swiker. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to begin by thanking the Millsaps chapter of Phi Beta Kappa for the invitation to speak at this event and to engage students and faculty. I especially want to thank Professor Powers for arranging my visit with great care. And I must say that it is an honor for me to be here at Millsaps because I share with this school a connection to United Methodism. Perhaps you will hear a little Wesley in this lecture. We'll have to see. Finally, I thank each of you for coming here this afternoon. And that being said, let me begin. My task in this lecture is to isolate the seductions of transhumanism as deeply moral and religious in character, and additionally to provide an argument, also religious and moral in character, to resist those seductions. My tactic is going to be to outline a theological and also humanistic ethics over and against the transhumanist agenda. I realize that if time allowed, we could and should address the question of the responsible use of specific technologies that promise to refashion human existence. So granting that limit, limitation on my lecture, we're going to see three seductions of transhumanism that have to do first with the logic of moral responsibility, second, the duties of the responsible life, and third, the aim or good of responsible existence. Transhumanism seeks to reduce human vulnerability through technologically perfecting our capacities. It therefore aims at what is called a post-human future. So the three seductions of transhumanism that I want to explore in a bit find their focus in the relation between vulnerability and perfectibility of human nature. But otherwise, my argument must answer the seductions of transhumanism, but also, and centrally, its claims about human nature. Now, I'm mindful that the idea of human nature will seem odd, implausible, quaint, or out of date to some. The spirit of our time, at least in the Western Academy, is skeptical of ontological and metaphysical ideas of a human essence or the human nature. For some, the various technologies that are now mapping and changing our genetic structures means that the idea of nature is no longer usable. A deeper worry, at least I think, is that talk about human nature too often has been used to exclude people from moral consideration. We know the horrific use 
of the idea of human nature to exclude Jews, African Americans, and women for rights and respect of respect and inclusion. The way around that problem on that current account is to speak of identity markers rather than human nature. Identity markers like race or gender or class. Now, all of these worries about the use of the term human nature must be granted, but even if we grant them, which we do, we still face a problem. It is hard, if not impossible, to clarify what is meant by the human good if we cannot include reflections on the needs and capacities of our species. So without entering the debate about the nature of nature, I'm going to be using a rather modest idea of human nature, one that is not fraught with much metaphysical baggage, but is ethically needed. Human nature, as Francis Fukuyama has nicely put it, quote, is the sum of behaviors and characteristics that are typical of the human species arising from genetic rather than environmental factors, unquote. So let that stand, at least provisionally, for what is meant by the idea of human nature. For the transhumanist, the defining characteristic of being human is the drive or aspiration to overcome our biological constitution and the limits it places on human life. This transformed or new humanity can be conceived in different ways. Genetic engineering, dreams about cloning, ideas about downloading our memories into computers so that we have a kind of technological immortality. Others talk about cyborg existence, that is the melding of machine and human stock. The focus of my argument is the question of whether or not we can and should accept the transhumanist conception of human nature and therefore its account of the human good. I'm going to argue that we have solid ethical and theological reasons to resist those claims, and therefore we need to adopt a different picture or vision of human life than that advocated by transhumanists. In fact, I'm going to insist, perhaps somewhat paradoxically, that Christian faith commits one to being a humanist rather than a transhumanist. Christian faith is a way of keeping human life human. My reflections move on several broad and interrelated planes of reflection. I start by identifying the question posed by transhumanism about human nature. With those in hand, I then turn and isolate three seductions of transhumanism. And finally, I will conclude by moving on to providing a Christian account that can avoid those seductions of transhumanism. Along the way, I will also indicate how one could be a Christian transhumanist, as odd as that may sound. And the possibili that possibility is why my argument must be both ethical and theological. So then, what is the basic question which transhumanism poses about human nature? Now, if one looks around the contemporary world, it would appear that virtually every form of life on our planet is open to enhancement or in danger through the use of human power. We have, for instance, curtailed or eradicated certain diseases, as well as technologically advanced human life. Think of the glasses that are posed on many of our noses. In bioethics, this has led to a raging debate about the relation and distinction between therapeutic intervention, say, our glasses or heart valves, and non-therapeutic intervention, say the use of steroids by athletes or so-called designer babies and the like. The driving power behind all of these developments is the fantastic expansion of human power through the use of technology. Now, given the fact of technological manipulation of life, it's hardly surprising that we hear phrases like reverence for life, sanctity for, of life, dignity of life, respect of life. These are ubiquitous in social and political and religious discourse, particularly in this state as you're debating Proposition 26. Right? They are found in church statements, political slogans, international documents like the Earth Charter. There are advocates of every form of enhancing life. 
but also those like the late Methodist theologian Paul Ramsey, who worried that through technology, those who come after us will not be like us. Against the backdrop of the horrors of the 20th century, the Holocaust and untold forms of unethical medical experimentation, it is not hard to understand the threats to our humanity. Leon Cass, a student of Paul Ramsey, wrote the following. Can we continue to reap the benefits of our new biology, our emerging biotechnologies, without eroding our freedom and dignity? What features of our humanity most need defending, both in practice and in thought? What solid ideas of human nature and the human good could be summoned to that cause? Yet despite, uh, yet the, excuse me, yet the desire and even the imperative to enhance life is rife in popular culture. Think of the movie Avatar, which has human scientists figuring out how to clone hu the bodies of the people of Perdo uh, Pandora and then trans uh, transmutating the mind of a human subject into that body for physical and moral benefit. Or recall the movie The Matrix, which is a kind of enhancement dystopia human beings turned into living batteries for machines. The archetype for these kinds of works, the struggle of life to overcome death, is of course Frankenstein. Or maybe it was Goethe's Faust. Or even further back, maybe it was the Promethean myth, or Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. In other words, there is something deep and enduring about the human aspiration for what is higher, nobler, greater, through the use of power to overcome, to change, to perfect what and who we are. The question of life, its meaning and value, and how, if at all, it should be enhanced, perfected, or transcended beyond the po present conditions has been a persistent theme in Western religious and philosophical thought. In fact, one might be bold enough to say that it, it poses the existential question. How do we live between aspiration and limitation, between the pull of ideals of perfection and an affirmation of the limits of finitude, including often painful and death-dealing limits? It can be bluntly put the question most forcefully, is it good to be only human. Let me explain a bit further. An initial definition of transhumanism by one of its leading voices, Nick Bostrom, is found reprinted, not surprisingly, in his Wikipedia article on the subject. We read the following. Transhumanism is an international intellectual and cultural movement that affirms the possibility and desirability of fundamentally transforming the human condition by developing and making widely available technologies to eliminate aging and to greatly enhance human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities. Transhumanism is therefore viewed as a form of philosophical posthumanism. Bostrom, who was co-founder with David Pierce of the World's Transhumanist Association, goes on to note that transhumanism is the heir of, the, of Enlightenment rational humanism and its focus on critical reasoning and empirical sciences. Now at issue here are several things. Um, and I should note parenthetically, if you pick up the front page of the New York Times today, you will see an article on the modification of things to stop aging. So the, what we're discussing here is as relevant and present as the front page of the newspaper. So technology, the transhumanists claim, will enable us to overcome attributes of our species, like aging, as well as intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities that can be extended, eliminated, or enhanced. Human nature is then, on this account, inherently plastic. It's moldable. The main focus is on aging, and so the use of technology in a war on death. They don't deny death qua death. Bostrom knows that the universe is going to end at some point, and therefore the conditions for life. 
Rather, the concern is to extend life and to slow down the process of aging in ways that are judged desirable. Now, in this slide, it is clear that the ageless question of what it means to be human is posed in our technological age in a specific way, namely, in terms of the relation between the vulnerability of human beings, that we are mortal, that we suffer, that we fear, and yet also the perfectibility of human life, say through education, the formation of virtuous character, or therapeutic and non-therapeutic means to enhance or overcome our given condition. This simultaneous relation of vulnerability and perfectibility subject to technological manipulation moves us one step closer to the real challenge posed by transhumanism. How so? Well, we have to decide if these structures of our existence are to be lived, endured, even treasured in their tension that is, to live in the tension between our vulnerability and our perfectibility, or conversely, as transhumanism seems to suggest, we ought to reduce vulnerability through the project of perfectibility. The transhumanist idea is to see vulnerability not as a constitutive feature of humanity without which we would somehow not be human, but rather as a limit to overcome or be eliminated. Now, two options are played out in popular culture and scholarly books and journals around this question of vulnerability and perfectibility in human nature. On one account, the transhumanist, the question is whether or not human beings can by themselves or religiously through divine aid overcome mortality, folly, and ignorance, fear, pain, and sorrow into a condition that is unmarked by those vulnerabilities. Julian Huxley, a biologist and the first director of UNESCO, whose brother, ironically enough, was Aldous Huxley, who wrote A Brave New World. Julian supposedly is the first to use the term transhumanist. He nicely articulates this first option on the question of human nature and vulnerability and perfectibility in them. He writes, the human species can, if it wishes, transcend itself, not just sporadically, an individual here in one way, an individual there in another way, but in its entirety, its humanity. We need a new name for this new belief. Perhaps transhumanism will serve. Man remaining man, but transforming himself by realizing new possibilities for his nature. The transhumanist declaration, the version of March 2009, put it most starkly in its first article. Uh, I find this chilling, but let me give it. Humanity stands to be profoundly affected by science and technology in the future. Who would debate that? It goes on, we envision the possibility of broadening human potential by overcoming aging, cognitive shortcomings, involuntary suffering and confinement to planet Earth. The human, this human aim of human aspiration then could be found in some non-human perfect realm, such as do downloading our memories into commu uh, computers, or within the overcoming of humanity within finite reality, as someone like Friedrich Nietzsche might argue, and still others might look at for a full-fledged post-humanist future in the use of technology to forge what Donna Haraway has called in one of her books, cyborg existence. For these thinkers, despite their profound differences, which I can't go into, accepting the limitations and the vulnerability of our species as important for our existence, accepting that would mean a flattening out of life a confinement to planet Earth, and thus destructive of actual human aspiration. The other side of the debate, a second option in the current discussion about human nature, 
is found among some thinkers who worry that ideals about human perfection alienate human beings from being, to use Martin Heidegger's terms, or that aiming too high risks mutilating finite goods needed for human flourishing, as Tzetan Tataroff has put it. Human beings on this account should cultivate authentic modes of finite existence, seeing death as our inmost possibility for authentic human life, and also work for the well-being of others. Despite the differences between these thinkers, which are also immense, the root impulse among them seems to be how can we find a home in the world? and that part of the human good is precisely the givens and limitations of human life. The question is how to treasure vulnerability. As Martha Nussbaum has put this, quote, the temptation of perfection is to despise what is merely human and everyday, unquote. Now, lest uh, Christians and theologians imagine that this transhumanist agenda is somehow nothing but a secular ideology, of technological power gone mad, it is important to see that there are Christians' versions of something like the transhumanist idea of perfection. For some Christians, the final destiny of human life is friendship with God, the beatific vision, as Thomas Aquinas put it, conceived in the, as the perfection of human life. Or as orthodox thinkers have put this, the good of human existence is theosis, that is, the transformation of human existence into God-likeness. Other theologians accentuate the discontinuity rather than the continuity, such as Aquinas does, between our created nature and our redeemed nature. Recently, the theologian Catherine Tanner has insisted on grace without nature. And this means focusing on the plasticity and radical malleability of human beings to remake themselves or to be remade by the divine. In Christ, we become, on Tanner's argument, post-human. There is a radical discontinuity between natural and redeemed existence sense, to be very precise, in Tanner's vision of the Christian faith, human beings do not have a nature. In other words, some Christian conceptions of redeemed and transformed human beings are themselves types of transhumanism made possible by grace, God's grace in Christ. Is that true of what John Wesley meant by Christian perfection? Now, it must be noted that the ongoing debate of technological possibilities for enhancing life in terms of either vulnerability or perfectibility might actually have been rendered mute by this point. With the increase of technological power to intervene and alter basic forms of life, from the genetic to the environmental, the distinction between the natural and the artificial is being lost. And this confounds the debate we just went through, since despite what Todorov or Cass wants to argue, we seem to need to find norms for responsible action without appeal to human nature. And yet, conversely, human power, over and against what Bostrom and Haraway want to argue, must acknowledge forms of life that constrain human action because of our vulnerability. In other words, we need an ethics that grounds moral duties in something other than an appeal to nature, but one that finds the ethical aim of life in the integration of different, different forms of life endangered or altered by technological power. It looks like, and this is why I think we're having such dispute about this um, around the country, it looks like we want both our cake and to eat it as well at the same time. We want appeals to nature and ethics, and yet we do not want them. Can ethics have it both ways? Now that question really sets the task for the rest of this lecture. The job I contend is to grasp the ways in which human freedom is bound to responsibility for respecting and enhancing the integrity of life, including human life. This endorses vulnerability as a limit on perfectibility and a good limit as well. 
Moreover, affirming the vulnerabilities of life as an ingredient to what it means to be a responsible human being itself is a claim about being human. Paul Ricoeur, French philosopher, recently deceased, in an early essay entitled, What Does Humanism Mean?, makes the point. He writes, man is man when he knows that he is only man. The ancient call, ancients called man mortal. This remembrance of death indicated at the very, in the very name of man introduces the reference to a limit at the heart of the affirmation of man himself. When faced with the pretense of absolute knowledge, humanism is therefore the indication of an only. We are only men. So the root question again is whether or not morally and religiously it is good to be only human and what form that affirmation should take. This reinstates the demand I'm arguing for some form of humanism rather than transhumanism. What kind of humanism it entails will be clear, I hope, at the last step in this lecture. But in order to develop that account, we need now to shift to another plane of reflection to the seductions of transhumanism, the three seductions I noted before. Now, my claim so far has been that the, that the root of the debate about transhumanism, at that root, are conflicting accounts of what it means to be a human being. On one side of the debate, it is held that our vulnerabilities, that we are death-bound, are the conditions for perfectibility, and that through technological and religious means, we can overcome, we can transcend nature into a post-human future. Somehow we will no longer be only human. The other side of the debate insists that human vulnerability is a limit on perfectibility, and a good one as well. In other words, for this side of the argument, we lose something basic to the human good if we no longer have to live with the awareness of our vulnerabilities, including the fact of death. We would lose virtues like courage, or profound gratitude for our being, or the wisdom that comes from very hard experience. My own account that I'm developing, and I have hinted at, is that we see the human project in terms of responsibility for the integrity of life. The position I advance wants to place human power in the service of responsibility. It requires that any act to enhance life must first meet the moral demand to respect a form of life. And finally, ethics must begin with the awareness of the vulnerability of the integrity of life to the workings of power. That is how I'm going to try to have my cake and to eat it too. And in order to bring precision to that, we need to explore the seductions of transhumanism. Matters get a bit technical here since we're entering into questions in moral theory. So I hope you can bear with me. Given the scope of the topic, this part of the lecture will take approximately five hours. <laughs> <clears throat> but I want to go through these three seductions because they are seductions. The first is a logical seduction. So one seduction of transhumanism is logical. That is, it says, if through technological means we can extend life and enhance capacities, then we ought to do so. The logic here is can implies ought. Transhumanists argue that there are only two constraints on that logic of can implies ought. One, that enhancing life by technological means should accord with liberty of choice and it should enhance well-being. And second, that the connection between can and ought is linked to empirical conditions. That is, the precise point in time when technology will, in fact, enable the extension and enhancement of human life. So the only limits on, the t on technological enhancement are that an individual has the right to refuse the use of life extending or capacity enhancing technologies and two, there's a good probability that the technology will actually work. And here's the nub of the first seduction. 
because appeals to f individual choice actually conceal the reason why the logic of can implies ought is false, because appeals to choice can conceal relations of power and vulnerability. The choice to use life-enhancing technologies is not free-floating individual choice or act of freedom, but actually involves distinct relations that are marked not by equality, but by vulnerability and imbalances of power. For instance, I have power over my body in some respect. I can also exert power over others and especially those who have come after me, my children. I have power over my body. I am additionally vulnerable to the power of others who can harm or help me physically as well as psychologically and socially. But others are vulnerable to me in various degrees. Further, I am, my own identity is vulnerable to my body. I can assure you that I can no longer play soccer the way I did when I was younger, and that fact has changed my self-understanding, my identity. So my very identity is vulnerable to the body, even as the body is vulnerable to my own sense of judgment. Put differently, we exist in relations of power and vulnerability that the logic of can implies ought conceals. And it makes that logic make, makes power the primary end. The power I have over my own body, for instance, and perfectibility. Those become the only relevant moral criteria in exercising acts of choice. But in fact, the act of choice is not about my free disposal over myself, since my sense of self involves different power relations, as do yours and as do different cultures. Technological power, if, even if freely chosen, can inflict unwarranted suffering and thus be immoral, as well as distort or impede attaining well-being as the purpose of action, and hence it can be unethical. Now, if we make ourselves aware of these asymmetrical relations of power concealed in the talk about individual choice, then with respect to the use of technologies, there is necessarily the formula ought implies can, not can implies ought. But importantly, in our technological age, the principle that ought implies can, in other words, that moral duty discloses freedom of action, means something different than when it was formulated by the great modern thinkers like Immanuel Kant. Kant argued that duty is a dictate of pure practical reason and thus a law of personal freedom, which likewise respects the humanity of others who are also rational free agents. But in this age, I'm suggesting, the moral constraints on action arise not from rational freedom, but from relations of power and vulnerability, asymmetrical ones rather than principles of equality that must place constraints on possible courses of actions and policies. In terms I've used before, we have to ground moral duties in something other than the idea of human nature. And I'm suggesting it's grounded in the demand that asymmetrical relations of power in order to be moral and ethical, must not inflict suffering on the vulnerable in the belief that somehow might makes right or that the end justifies the means, the use of, the pow of power of the strong over the weak. In other words, in relations of asymmetrical power, one must assert that there is a reversibility of obligations among agents because persons are due the same moral consideration and ought to relate to each other in mutual recognition and symmetrical regard. Put less technically, given imbalances of power, what is demanded of me is also demanded of you, and vice versa. 
the act of enhancing current life in ways that deprive future human beings the determination over their own lives and the choices they might want to make, um, even if the desire is to enhance their lives technologically, removes the possibility of free personal action from themselves. It asserts the power of present persons, us, over first future persons in a way that makes uh, the right, uh, excuse me, in a way that justifies the endless extension of power. Such actions, in other words, deny reversibility and thus are immoral and unethical. The complaint that we are dependent on the irreversible and asymmetrical relation of power to our parents, which we all are, is no counterargument. Why? Because that relation is biological as well as moral and ethical in ways that highlight rather than denying vulnerability. In the light of technological power, ought implies can is about the limit imposed by the symmetry of valid moral and ethical relations. Now this argument for insisting on the priority of ought implies can, rather than can implies ought, is rooted ultimately in beliefs about the status of persons, present and future, and their rights and duties. It also means that there is a priority of the demand to respect others, including future others, over the requirements to enhance life. The basic duty of this responsible life is not and cannot always be everywhere simply to increase human power. The formula ought implies can means that the end sought is constrained by the integrity of life in situations of asymmetrical power. The ends do not justify the means. Now, of course, these points demand further argument, both philosophical and theological, in order to be sustained. Part of the argument is to gain, gain clarity about the relation between respect and the demand to enhance. So I'm going to now move from the first logical seduction of transhumanism to the second one, about the relationship between respecting and enhancing life that is the realm of moral duties. Further, respect and enhancement are what philosophers call thick concepts. They carry with them multiple meanings that we need to unpack. What is crucial is the proper relation between them. Transhumanism distorts responsibility in this second sed seduction because it places the duty to enhance first almost to the exclusion of respect. Yet on my own account, we are to respect and only then to enhance the integrity of life. So let's explore these thick concepts. Everyone with me so far? Yeah? OK. We'll see on this level, it's interesting that it, it mirrors now at the level of moral concepts the problem embedded in the logical seduction. So uh, you should see these three seductions as sign of, like layers of an onion. <laughs> Right? I started at the most abstract, and we're moving to the more concrete, but it's all about this problem of power, vulnerability, and perfectibility. And now we're doing it at the level of terms used to designate moral duties, respect and enhance. Now, if we think about it for a moment, we see that respect is a concept that specifies the attitude toward or acknowledgement of the moral standing of some being that focuses on recognition, when you respect someone, you recognize them, and also non-intervention. Respect then seems linked to a sense of dignity, which, arising out of ancient Hellenistic thought, dignity denotes height, excellence, or honor. So respect is the posture, the attitude, or sensibility that one can and should take to others, human or non-human, that is keyed to their dignity. Together, the conceptual package, respect, dignity, aims to articulate the standing or claim to consideration of self and other, human or non-human. In other words, packaged into our very 
sense or experience of respecting someone or something is a recognition of their dignity. And the trick is to keep both sides of the package going. Concepts for what we are responding to that are not reducible to our acts of power, dignity, and the psychological dynamics at play in moral attitudes and feelings, respect. What about enhancement? My sense is, is that this is an underexplored and under-theorized concept. Linguistically, its roots are in terms that mean to rise, to lift, to augment, to increase, to elevate. To enhance something is to have the sense that one should make that thing, whatever it is, better, greater, in some definable way. But what is not clear, and this is the whole issue, is what its correlate concept is. Whereas respect is correlate to some sense of dignity of someone or something that evokes the experience of respect in one, what about enhancement? It would seem on the face of it that it is the vulnerability or the perfectibility of something, entity, state of affairs, or form of life to one's power to make it greater or bigger, better. Enhancement, vulnerability, and perfectibility are all packaged together. In other words, and confusedly, the sense that we ought to enhance life is correlated both to life's vulnerability to power and to its perfectibility by power, how it might be more richly integrated. But vulnerability and perfectibility pull in opposite directions. When something or someone is vulnerable, this means that he, she, or it is capable of physical and emotional wounds or harms. The vulnerable are at risk in relations of power. Perfectibility, by contrast, is to have the capacity for improvement that is brought about by self-labor or the actions of others upon us. Yet notice, the sense that we ought to enhance life does not help us distinguish between vulnerability and perfectibility, how they should be ordered and interrelated, and that fact shows its great danger. The sense that we ought to enhance life that we have a duty to do so transpires in relations where someone has the power to augment or to harm another's life or one's own. Yet if the correlate of enhancement is perfectibility, then the vulnerability of the other places no limits on what one can rightly do to them or for them or with them. Think again of Frankenstein, the monster, actually. Yet if vulnerability is the correlate to the duty to enhance, if the package is enhancement and vulnerability rather than enhancement and perfectibility, um, it is not clear that we should use technological means at all to enhance the lives of those, of those over whom we have power. In other words, at the very core of transhumanism and its agenda of enhancing life is a massive and confusing ambiguity. Are there no limits on power to enhance life because life can always be made better, it can be perfected? Or does the vulnerability of living things mean that in the end we should never seek to make others' lives better? And to say, as Bostrom did, that the limit on enhancing life is the free choice of individuals to forswear the use of technologies, therapeutic or non-therapeutic, is to miss the point. As noted, we experience vulnerability and perfectibility even in our relation to our bodies and ourselves. The appeal to choice masks that fact rather than providing moral guidance. The ambiguity about the correlate idea to enhancement, whether it's perfectibility or vulnerability, is extremely important. I mean, just seeing this ambiguity is important because it helps to explain why Therapeutic intervention, which begins with vulnerability and only then may lead to perfectibility, is hard to distinguish from non-therapeutic actions, which seem to start with the idea of perfectibility and may only acknowledge vulnerability along the way. In other words, there is an instability 
in the basic sense that we ought to enhance the integrity of life whenever and wherever we can. And if that is right, at least at a simple descriptive level, uh, then we are able to see why in our time the question of enhancing life has become so pressing and why there are the two op options that I noted before. Forms of life are now vulnerable and perfectible through human powers in ways previously unimagined. And this fact accounts for the opposing positions that I noted, those like Cass and Ramsey that want to limit human power because of their profound awareness of the vulnerability of life. And on the other hand, those like transhumanists who want to extend life without end because their focus is on the perfectibility of life and seeking its increase. Now I can put my own judgment bluntly and then I'm going to make an argument for it. Try to make an argument for it. Uh, the radical increase of technological power and the ambiguity in the sense that we should enhance life means that the moral demand of respect must take priority over the ethical project of enhancement. Vulnerability is a limit on the drive to perfection, puts forms of enhancement in the service of dignity and respect. And actually, there's ancient wisdom in that conclusion. Throughout the ages, Christian thinkers have insisted that duties of non-malevolence, that is to do no harm, must take priority over duties of benevolence and beneficence. Th this is why the Ten Commandments are formulated in the negative. <clears throat> While we should do all that we can to promote life and to tend to the needs of others, there's a prior demand not to harm, not to kill, not to rob, false witness, and so on. In other words, once again, the end does not justify the means. Might does not make right. That is to say, we can ground duties like respect and enhance within the character of asymmetrical relations of power. Respect is to dignity what enhancement is to vulnerability and perfection. And we've now grounded these two duties and their relation in something other than an appeal to nature. We've grounded them in the problem of asymmetrical power relations. Now I'm profoundly aware of how hard it is to make this kind of argument in a culture that assumes that the end does justify the means, that if we can, then we ought, and that to act otherwise seems uncaring and somehow anti-human. After all, if we can save future babies from some disease by genetically altering sperm and egg, why not? If we can overcome the threat of senility by downloading brains into computers, why not? But in order to see the reason we can and must make this argument for the priority of respect over enhancement as the duties of responsibility, realizing we need them both but in the right order, then we are led to a third seduction, and another plane of reflection about the aim or purpose of the responsible life. And that is the case because duties only make sense in relation to some good or purpose they are meant to protect and promote. As Philippa Foote has argued, we can only clarify the good of a living being in relation to the life form of its species. The question of the good, then, is the third seduction of transhumanism, rooted in the deeper challenge I noted before of what it means to be human. And holding together the idea of obligations rooted in relations of power, respect and enhance, with the goods needed for a human life to flourish, given its or species nature, is how I'm trying to have my cake and eat it too. To not appeal to nature on one level and to appeal to it on another level. So the transhuman good, we're moving to the third seduction and getting ever closer towards the end. Now we already know the good of transhumanism, as I quoted before, it, it, it quote, envisions the possibility of broadening human potentials by overcoming aging, cognitive shortcomings, involuntary suffering, and our confinement to planet Earth, unquote. The seduction is to believe that that's an adequate account of the human good. Is that the case? Now, human actions and relations arise and are rooted in 
in life, our desires, our vitalities, our capacities, our needs. Human freedom, in other words, is always entangled with these vitalities and needs as we strive for some integrity in our lives and our communities. The good which human actions and relations should respect and enhance is what I will call the integrity of life. And let me explore this idea against the backdrop of the seduction of the transhumanist ideas about the good. By integrity, I mean two related but distinct things. First, integrity designates the integration or drawing together of a range of goods sufficient to fulfill basic needs and to express capacities that are necessary for a form of life to continue to exist, that is, to resist death. The range or kinds of goods differ depending upon the type of life one is examining. A human being, for instance, has needs and capacities for reflection and meaning missing at other organic levels of life. Even as human beings, no less than cells or animals, must metabolize energy through interaction and communication with environments. In each case, there is some kind of integration that is the life process. The use of the concept life across diverse species is rooted in this dynamic of integration. The main threat to any form of life, accordingly, is disintegration, the weakening of the life process to the point of non-being or death. Yet even the concept death is predicated of beings owing to the diverse ways they integrate their lives. And this is why Christians have always known that human beings can die in many different ways. Physical death, social death through the disintegration of meaningful communities, existential death and the loss of meaning and purpose, spiritual death, or the denial of the spiritual integrity of life in God. So too, and interestingly enough, one can be physically alive and yet spiritually dead. One can be existentially alive and physically dying. The mark of finite life, then, in contrast to divine life, is that the capacity of integration is never total. And in time, either is destroyed or dissipates to the point of disintegration and thus death. Furthermore, any form of life advances or thwarts the integration of life in itself and others. There's real conflict in the world as well as real concord. What we mean by good and evil on this first meaning of integrity then are actions and relations that enable good or thwart evil the integration of life among beings. If time and space allowed, we could explore the, in detail the range of goods entailed in this account of integrity of life, what I've called elsewhere basic goods, social goods, goods of locality, reflexive goods. But please note, in order to enhance any form of life, one must first respect the goods it needs to integrate in order to flourish. So now we can relate the duties that I've isolated before. No enhancement without respect for a being's integrity. No respect that is not open to enhancing the integrity of life. Now integrity in the second but related sense denotes moral or spiritual goodness. It is the goodness that arises from dedication in action and relations to respect and enhance the integration of life in others as well as in oneself. This meaning of integrity specifies the moral good, a kind of spiritual goodness that is only attainable, no matter how momentary or fragmentarily, through responsible action. A life of moral integrity is one that is integrated, not just in terms of the range of goods that must be met and the capacities fulfilled for us to flourish, but more radically, through a committed project of respecting and enhancing those goods in, with, and for others. What is more, moral integrity arises not with the brute awareness of power to integrate life, or even with needs and capacities, 
Rather, it denotes the exercise of capacities for action in, with, and for others where the power to act is deployed to respect and enhance rather than to demean and destroy the integrity of life. It is the self-limitation of power arising from respect for the dignity and awareness of the vulnerability of others. Now, human beings exist in these interrelated senses of integrity that I've just noted. That is, the integration of goods and needs rooted in the vitality of life amid forces of disintegration and death, as well as the call of conscience to moral or spiritual integrity. And with that, we have now returned to Paul Ricoeur's warning that we are only human, but with a proviso. Yes, we are only human and must live with the tensions that are at the core of our being, and yet only human beings can and ought to be responsible for the integrity of life with and for others. Only human beings can respond to their limitations and vulnerabilities by acting with and for others on earth and in time. Only human beings can be responsible here and now for the future of finite life without the need to overcome our confinement on planet Earth. In fact, the human project is defined by responsibility for, not confinement to, life on our endangered planet. As Wesley might put it, Christian perfection is the love of God and the love of neighbor. However, the argument I've just outlined about responsibility with and for others does not stand alone. In order to make it stick, requires one more shift to another plane of reflection, and this brings me, I'm glad you, you'll be glad to hear, to the final step in this uh, lecture against the seductions of transhumanism. So finally, God and the next humanity. Now while I've bracketed theological claims thus far in these reflections, they have nonetheless appeared at various junctures. I noted that some Christians' ideas about redemption seem to be a form of transhumanism. Yet we saw that for many Christians there is wisdom in putting respect before enhancement, duties of non-malevolence before beneficence or benevolence, even though the full reach of Christian responsibility includes both of those sensibilities. A humanist outlook, I remarked, asserts that we are human, only human, whereas transhumanism aids at a post-human future. It's asserting it's not good only to be human. My argument has meant to convince you that the seductions of transhumanism not only conceal basic facts of human personal and social life, like we exist in relations of power, but also that its conception of human nature and our good is at best one-sided. Without denying the sense that we should enhance life, I have linked enhancement to human vulnerabilities and the need to protect, and, th and thus to relate it also to the duty of respecting others so that power in any form does not become its own good. This is also to suggest that with the duty of respect in place, there are proper uses of technological means to enhance life, that is, to transform vulnerabilities as well as to respect our, or perfect our capacities. And that, I've argued all along, is how I want my ethics to both have its cake and eat it too. Still, one question remains to be addressed, actually a, a rather disconcerting question. Why should we accept, even embrace, the fact that we are only human? As far as I can tell, despite Ricoeur's claims to the contrary, there is nothing within humanism itself that can answer that question. Yes, we are mortal, and we have etched into our being a remembrance of death, yet why ought that remembrance be embraced? within in our affirmation of life. Put more forcefully, why should our love of life and the desire that we have more life and that our loved ones have more and more life, why should we accept that we're only human? And it is here, as I suggested before, that Christian faith ironically commits us to a kind of humanism. 
It answers the question which humanism on its own cannot, cannot answer in the face of the transhumanist challenge, namely, why we can and may and must affirm and embrace the fact that we are mortal, we are only human. Explaining this point will conclude my reflections. The Christian message, briefly stated, is that God is the power and depth of life manifested in time and on earth in the human Christ, a power made perfect in the loving service of others. This, this insight enables the Christian imagination to intensify the law of freedom and choice inscribed initially in biblical discourse in terms of the double love command, that is to love God and to love neighbors as ourselves. St. Paul in Galatians 5.13 pushes this intensification of the Christian imagination to its extremes and makes the following, I think, astonishing claim. He writes, for you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves one to another. Then here's the radical claim. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, once life is seen in Christ, then the double love command, love God and love neighbor, becomes intensified in the direction of love for the human other as a limit on human and divine power. One is called to be human, truly human, in the freedom of love, just as Christ is true God, true man. In other words, Christian faith is not about the plasticity of human beings to be remade in the image of God. This faith talks about the power of divine life in mortal existence in such a way that one can and may be truly human without denial or hatred of the fact that we are only human. As I said before, the form of human freedom is responsibility for the integrity of life with and for others on earth. And that is merely to say that responsibility is the form that Christian life, love takes in our mortal existence. A type of humanism is thereby possible when the limits on human power is not simply the sting of mortality or free choice to use or not use life-enhancing technologies, but much more the love of God through love of neighbor on earth and in time with others. The limit on human power is its transformation into service and love for others as oneself. And here is enacted, in a way contrary to transhumanism, the overcoming or the perfection of the human existence such that we are truly human, <coughs> excuse me. The possibility is the claim of the Christian conscience that seeks not to escape confinement to planet Earth, but rather to grasp the fullness of human existence in responsibility for the integrity of life. Now someone might ask me, as I'm concluding, how this response to the seductions of transhumanism is possible for non-Christians. Well, giving the demonstration of that possibility has actually been one of the purposes of this lecture, and it's why I only approach theological claims at the very end. One can accept my arguments that I forwarded morally and ethically against transhumanism without necessarily being Christian. But what I've also shown is how Christians can and ought to join with other responsible people to forge a humane and responsible ethics to counter the seductions of transhumanism while also combating transhumanist ideas within their own tradition, which I've tried to do. I can leave it to faithful people in other traditions to attempt the same for their communities while asking non-religious people simply to affirm the shared ethical insights. And in this way, we might secure some common ground in working for a truly human future. Thank you very much.